The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Hey, hey, Wolfpack! We're back! And right now, it's time! Time to finally talk about the greatest, creepiest, funniest, most recognizable mascot of the Goosebumps franchise, Slappy the Dummy and his first beloved classic tale of nightmare fuel, Night of the Living Dummy. No, this isn't a biography about Rob Schneider's career, but rather R.L. Stein's most popular killer doll story and the introduction of the best Goosebumps monster ever. But some of you may be asking, hey, Night of the Living Dummy 2, where's Night of the Living Dummy 1? Well, you can find our review on the first book right here. Okay, okay, just kidding. Here's the real deal. There was no Night of the Living Dummy 1. At least not in film form. Goosebumps the TV show apparently never adapted the first Living Dummy book onto the big screen at all. I've heard rumors from the internet that the showrunners tried to make the first book an actual episode, but they had to cancel it since it was deemed too scary for kids. Or there's the more likely belief that the show just wanted to get to the second book instantly, since the book fans truly loved it more than the first one, and the small fact that Slappy was not major in the first novel. Oh yeah, that's right, Slappy wasn't the villain of the first book. He took over the role of Stein's evil puppet demon from the second book onward. In the original Night of the Living Dummy, we instead followed a different killer doll, dubbed Mr. Wood. <coughs> Mr. Wood? Seriously? <laughs> Sounds like the villain of the Goosebumps porno. But yes, Mr. Wood was the original living dummy and the villain in the first book. He died at the end of his short story, only to then get replaced by Slappy. However, Slappy proved to be much, much more entertaining, energetic, and disturbing compared to Woody. Kids liked him so much that Slappy skyrocketed in Goosebumps' popularity, while Mr. Wood faded away into obscurity until he was essentially gone. No! Slappy was simply an even better replacement. Mr. Wood did have his fair share of dark moments too, such as strangling dogs and going out of his way to kill his own foster family. But most audiences thought Slappy was better simply because he was practically the Joker and Chucky of the R.L. Stein universe. Mr. Wood was Captain Pike while Slappy was Captain Kirk. One was just cooler than the other. I honestly didn't care for the first Living Dummy. It was generic. The sequel also felt a tad too similar to the original's plot, but Slappy just reeks of unsettling dread, while Mr. Wood was more of a thug. I can see why kids thought Slappy was the superior dummy. However, we're not here for the great debate of Slappy versus Mr. Wood. We're here to see how well Slappy's debut to cinema is. There will be honestly very little comparisons to the book this time around, mainly because the episode actually adapts the story well enough. There are some really super small alterations that barely affect Stein's original recipe. Only the pointless filler was removed, and some scenes play out in the exact same way as in the book, but with some changes made to make it flow in the main plotline better, rather than branching off into something else like in the novel. The main cast is all intact, the writing is very much the same as the books, Slappy is still awesome, and the show does a near-perfect job at copying the book onto television. 
There's very little difference, but does a good job at adapting the novel faithfully still equal great horror storytelling? Is this tale of suspense still holding up its title of best Goosebump story by today? Is Slappy still the greatest Goosebumps monster of all time? Well, that's what we plan to find out. So keep an eye on all of your cute little friends in your room, because you'll never know if any of them have ulterior motives. We're shoving our fists up this puppet hard! Uh, that sounded less dirty in my head. Let's just go. This is our wacky review on the fan-favorite Goosebumps classic, Night of the Living Dummy 2. So, our beloved fan favorite episode introducing us to the coolest Goosebumps character ever opens up on uplifting happy music. Ah, gotta love how these grim masterclass horror tales start us off on such joyful tunes. Why can't all horror stories have such fun soundtracks? We then meet our main character, Amy Kramer, and her annoying as heck family. The Kramers are apparently the whitest family in the world since they host family show and tells once every week to have fun and pass all their free time. They're super white. The Kramers consist of the oh-so-iconic ditzy father played by Dr. Howling from How I Got My Shrunken Head. The weird cool mom, the jerk older sister Sarah, played by Jessica Walters from the Trilogy, the whiny dick brother Jed, played by Max Keegan from the Tale of Cutter's Treasure, and our main protagonist Amy Kramer, played by Sandra from the Tale of the Stone Maiden, which I reviewed by the way, so you should go see it. They are a relatively boring family of morons, so you just can't wait until a certain killer doll comes by to exterminate this place. I would probably care about them, but the only person who's likable in this story is Amy, because she's the normal girl, and she has a small character arc of being stuck as the middle child of the family. But her relatives, especially Amy's dick brother and sister, suck. Slappy could not kill them fast enough. I especially hate the idiot brother in this scene, where he acts annoying and shows off his crappy filmmaking. I thought it would be nice to show all the, I made all about us. I may be 13, may not live in the hood, may not carry no chrome, may not be allowed a cell phone at dinner, but I'm young and can do 18 push-ups and I'll speak the truth. That bastard. How dare you subject us to the visit rap? No, instead, he subjects us to his even worse TMZ audition tape while acting like a mega dick, as the family sits there and allows it. Guess who's sweater Amy's trying? Amy, yeah, Amy, can't you just let your brother film you undressing? Ugh. Girls, right? Are any of you surprised if I tell you that I hate Amy's siblings? It's here where Amy shows off her big character trait, her amateur ventriloquism, but her dummy Dennis literally falls apart, blowing her act. But it's all good because dear old dad bought her a new dummy, a much better puppet for her puppet shows, a dummy dubbed Slappy whom I'm sure nobody will ever enjoy in this franchise ever. 
She naturally adores the cute abomination, but gets a bit confused upon finding a weird business card in Slappy's pouch. But she makes nothing of it, because she's so happy to have her new toy. But, you know it, Slappy shows that he's alive, with a scary face. <coughs> uh... It's only the first few minutes, and Slappy is already going to try to outdo Lily D at the scary face close-up shots. Now there's going to be a flame war over which of Stein's killer dolls did it better, Lily D or Slappy. Just when you thought we were done with the scary face bits, Slappy pulls us back in. You know, directors, you can do more with killer dolls other than foreboding scary face shots. So Slappy is welcomed into his new home, but our hero Amy thinks there's something off about him. Huh, you'd think one of the sisters would notice how Slappy was speaking without Amy's voice in use, but they ignore this, and Amy goes off to bed because she's a moron. <laughs> Seriously, no one questions as to how Slappy talked without her doing anything? Is Amy just that good a voice actress? She's not nearly as good as me! And my little buddy, Shrinky Pinky! Isn't that right? Yep, we've got a better catitude! Unfortunate accident. Guess we'll never solve this case. Speaking of unsolved mysteries, while the family goes off to bed, Slappy finally performs his first evil thing, where he kicks old dummy Dennis out of his seat. <laughs> Really? Slappy selfish in bed? Oh, the horror! Apparently, Slappy was proud of that action, since he gives off another scary face. <coughs> oh, but now Slappy walks around on his own, where he then does something truly evil. Are you ready for this, kids? Because when Slappy has the Kramer family all alone, with everyone asleep and unassuming, he then... ruins the Jerk Sisters painting! <laughs> That's it? That's all you did? Behold, Slappy, the scariest monster from R.L. Stein's imagination, tossing toys on the floor and ruining children's drawings. I can't believe how overmarketed this guy is. Slappy sucks. Shut up, Paparena. The family then solidifies my hatred of them when they rather mean-spiritedly accuse Amy of ruining her sister's artwork and ground her. Yeah, they have no proof that Amy did this, and they act like jerks towards her. The Kramer family is just terrible. It's the oh-so-classic nobody-believes-me parents, and the siblings are basically... Generic idiot bullies, because they tease and accuse Amy for no real reason. While R.L. Stein has written bratty siblings before, usually the show has them undergo some character arc, even if little. But the Kramers are so detestable that you don't like them, or even buy it when they do become nicer to Amy. Speaking of which, I probably should tell you about Amy's character arc. 
Both the book and the show make Amy the middle child of the family. She's not old enough to be trusted by everyone, and she's not young enough to be cute or get away with anything, making her feel as if her family doesn't love her. So she spends most of the story trying to get the Kramer family to trust her and gain a little respect. This is a completely pointless plot element in the TV show because it goes absolutely nowhere. I won't lie, I think Amy's arc is something that weakens the episode. Amy never goes through any changes in her own story at all, which wouldn't be a huge problem, but this episode sets her up like she's going to be something more, only to ditch it the second Slappy steals the spotlight. Amy's middle child syndrome is meaningless, and it gets dropped just like that. So sorry, but it's a bad plot point. It means nothing. She's a vanilla protagonist. Amy is just not nearly as engaging as Anakin Skywalker was in part three. I don't like Sam. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. The only thing Amy has going for her is that she gets victimized by Slappy since he frames her for all the bad things happening around the house. To destroy her relationships, which he constantly reminds us of with another scary face. <laughs> We cut to the next week, where the idiot father wraps up his awful Garth Brooks impression, before it's time Amy at last comes up to the stage to test her new act with Slappy. Oh, thank goodness. Slappy is finally going to speak his mind. So, what does Slappy do once he's in full view of the idiot family? He does the most evil, despicable action you can possibly imagine. He torments them with his stand-up comedy routine. So, what did you think of Dad's song? And with your dad? Well, what about me? I thought the cat got stuck in the dishwasher. <laughs> That's not very nice. Sorry. And how about that friend of yours? She went to a store and asked the clerk if he had anything on size, and he told her to try the freight elevator. <laughs> Slappy would be good at cinema sins. You know, I was going to go on a tangent on how much I hate Amy's family, but honestly, Slappy does my job for me. Sadly, the family stops the roasting because they feel butthurt about Amy hurting their feelings. Hey, wait a sec. Didn't the dad say earlier? Amy, where's your sympathy? Amy, that's not very nice. Great parenting. I see the Bosch Tet family studied at the Richard Watterson School of Hypocrisy. It's, it's only funny when it happens to someone else. How could you do this to your own father? <laughs> So, in spite of showing obvious signs that Slappy is alive, the family acts like pricks towards Amy, accuse her of being bad again, and totally ground her. This family sucks. Why did people like this episode again? The Kramers are the most overtly mean-spirited hicks I've ever seen since the god-awful Haunting Hour tales, Spores and Mrs. Worthington. What's funnier was that in the book, the parents held these show-and-tell meetings to bring the family together. But the show has it breaking them apart even further. How long until Slappy kills them all? Amy is, of course, upset at Slappy and puts him away like a used buddy doll forever. Right after Slappy delivers another scary face. <laughs> The next day, everything is back to normal as Amy plays with her amazingly robotic acting friends. So, you think she's gonna ask you to the dance? I wish, but I can always go with Tyler. Alicia, what have you got there? No, I'm down. 
Look, sir, droids. Ugh. I know Goosebumps was infamous for some pretty bad child acting, but it really holds back this episode for me, since the guy playing Slappy is such a good actor, while the people he's playing off of don't have nearly as good a talent as our villain does. I can admit that Slappy is of course the best part of this story, in spite of my nitpicking. But the kids really should have done second takes. I also haven't brought this up much, but the effects used to show off Slappy are real nifty. We don't see him moving around that frequently. Instead, the show does a great job at having Slappy rearrange himself slightly whenever he's off camera for a few seconds. I just love how we don't always see the dummy motioning. Slappy moves himself whenever the camera cuts back to him, making him all the more terrifying since we're building up to his full-on movements once it hits the fan. Almost feels like Michael Myers or Jason, how the villain appears out of thin air. The subtle scariness flavor. Even I can confess how the puppet looks so intimidating, even when he's not showing life signs. There is a strong reason why this guy haunted our nightmares for years. But uh-oh, the little sister gets called upon by Slappy's box. Where I'm sure nothing bad can happen while she plays with him. Oh, come on, he's crushing a little girl's hand, and she can't cry better than that. So, after breaking the kid sister's wrist, Slappy instantly stops himself as soon as the mom walks in. What? Why? I thought you were trying to frame Amy as a bad kid. Isn't stopping yourself before doing more harm kind of foiling your tricks? Slappy sucks. No, he doesn't. He's just not on the A-game yet. To his credit, Slappy succeeds at ruining all of Amy's relationships, gets her grounded again, and mocks Amy with another scary face. <coughs> you know, why doesn't Amy smash him? I mean, at this point, she sees Slappy trying to assault her friends and is well aware of how evil he is, so why doesn't she just break him? No data available. The family has an emergency meeting regarding Amy's bad behavior and more on how she hates being the middle child, but as I said, her anime arc goes nowhere, so you don't care. Amy tries telling them that Slappy is the name of evil, but this is just another classic cliche where the hero tries telling them the truth, and of course, nobody believes her. Well, if he's not going to do anything... She runs off pissed, but just when we're about to feel sorry for Amy's family since they care about her well-being, the show soils the moment by reminding us why the idiot brother sucks. I'm not making this up! Hey, Amy, you want to play with us? Sure! Watch this! Later that night, even Slappy decides that he's finally had enough of the Bosch Tet parents, so he goes off to kill them after they fell asleep watching the Static Channel. Still better than the Bay Formers. I will admit that this is finally where Slappy evolves into a deadly force, since he is more menacing in these shots, and he reaches dangerous levels when he tries to smash the parents' skulls in with a guitar. A family picture. Sadly, before Slappy can finish them, Amy shows up to save the day. Ah, curse you, Amy! You prevented our killer doll from killing! Why? 
The parents naturally blame Amy for being bad again, and ground her for breaking Dad's gay tar. Really? No one questions why Slappy is conveniently there too on top of the guitar? I know the family believes Amy is using Slappy as a means to justify her bad behavior, but so many times there is evidence that Amy can use to prove her innocence and show Slappy had a role in these evil deeds, which she never points out. It makes everyone look like a moron. I always hate it when these kid heroes actually do have proof that can back them up, but they never use it because the plot demands it. The writers could just show off how Slappy is a smart villain, but nope. People are just stupid, and Slappy gets away with being a douche because of pure luck. He just acts creepy there with another scary face. <laughs> Ain't I a dick, kids? Well, at least Amy is better at handling evil dummies than Dale Gribble. Perimeter breach. Perimeter breach. <laughs> You'll never catch Dale Grib. <laughs> you were right, Bobbies. Ventriloquism is fun. The next day, we get a rare good scene with Amy's family, where if you can believe it or not, the parents actually reach out to her to find out what's wrong with her, but to no avail. And you know, I probably would not hold any negativity towards this tale if we had more scenes like this. We needed more human moments between Amy and her folks, since they do make you care for them when they're nice, and you hope they don't get slaughtered by not Chucky. I mean, am I really asking for too much when I say that writers should make the family side characters more loving and compassionate so that the audience would at least hope they make it out okay? Something that made The Haunting Hour so good was that the parents were actual people most of the time. So scenes like them being unreasonable douches just makes us hate them and want to see them die. And the fact that the show has this paper-thin, nobody-likes-the-middle-child gimmick is not enough to shield it because it goes nowhere. The Kramer family sucks, and was outclassed by much better family drama in the dummy sequels. Just saying, even in kid shows, we do need reasons to care for the characters our hero protects. Writing 101. The only thing that does save this episode overall is Slappy. Now, if only he can kill them all. Knowing her folks are failures, Amy at long last dumps her new boy toy for good. Well, he's Pennywise's problem now. Actually, that'd make a sweet death battle. Do it, screw attack. So Amy resumes her life like nothing happened whatsoever. But guess who's back? Well, tell Dad to wipe his stupid feet. Wait, the jerk sister thinks their idiot brother has the same shoe size as a small Muppet? Is everyone in this family a brain dead moron? See? <laughs> But, dun dun dun, Slappy surprises his ex-girlfriend in her room, with a scary face. <coughs> the puppet finally starts monologuing on what's really going on here. I know I've spent so much time dissing everybody's favorite murderous Muppet here, but I can now safely say that this is where the episode finally gets outstanding. Things really pick up speed with Slappy Central Focus. Right now, it's time for Backstory!
This is not outright detailed in the original source material, but R.L. Stein would soon go on to grant us Slappy's origin. Slappy used to be an evil sorcerer from ancient times, where he ruled the world with an iron fist, thanks to his fantastic powers of dark magic. However, as a human, he was still a mortal man. To keep his existence everlasting, Slappy carved out a puppet body from the coffins of the dead, where he then transferred his soul into the puppet body, leaving a magic spell card linked to the doll, so some unsuspecting fool in the future could resurrect him back to life. And he would carry on his wicked evil deeds once more but in our time. This was confirmed in Stein's later stories. However, the show and this book keep Slappy shrouded in the unknown. The show explains that he was just a toy, but Amy summoned him back to life, thanks to reading his magic card. You see, that stupid business card was actually a spell card. When the words are read out loud, Slappy is released into the mortal realm once again. But this time, his soul is linked to whomever uses the spell. He's alive because their souls are connected. As long as Amy lives, he lives. Their souls are fused together forever until one of them falls. But coming back to life isn't his only end goal. Slappy, in all versions of this story, ultimately intends to force Amy and her family to become his slaves. They will serve him, and based on the readings from Slappy World, help him rebuild his kingdom from scratch. The puppet is now the puppet master, and he wants their home to be his home. This is where Slappy finally graduates from stupid prankster to full-fledged diabolical mastermind. All the stupid pranks and framing he was doing throughout this entire episode were all really Slappy trying to burn away Amy's relationships with her friends and family so she would be forced to give in to him and he would have full control over her life now that no one can help her. She has no trust. After so much bullcrap with the Kramer's idiocy, I absolutely loved this dark turn, since the narrative and our big villain finally grow scary. Slappy is not just a terrifying killer doll, but he's also quite the cunning sadistic monster with a disturbing enjoyment for tormenting children. That's what makes him so horrific. It's not enough to kill people. But Slappy takes more pleasure in shattering their souls, forcing them to be his toys. Something that makes him all the more creepier is that Slappy displays quite a few unsettling parallels to an abusive control freak trying to dominate these poor girls in his adventures. Seriously, Slappy is so nightmarish in scenes like this that it almost feels uncomfortably realistic how he wants to draft these kids into his abusive relationships. You and I are one now. Inseparable. You are my slave. No, I'm not going to be your slave. You can't make me. Uh, I can make you do anything I want. You have no choice. Your whole family thinks you're crazy. I'd see that. <laughs> we'll lock you up. That's too real. This is actually scary. Where was this stuff during the rest of the episode? So much time is dedicated to the cliched family of morons doesn't believe our hero junk. But the episode gets magnificent when the dummy starts getting all up in our faces. The fact that Slappy doesn't just kill people is what makes him so unique as a villain, since he's out for so much more than blood. He wants little children to fall in line with him, or else he gets ugly. That packs so much horror napalm on us when that bomb is dropped. More of Slappy's subtle terror, please. 
Amy tries to refuse his new Reich, but Slappy will force her by trying every dirty trick in the book on her and the Kramers. Blackmail, frame-ups, gaslighting, and even death threats. All of it, until she gives in to him. Again, really creepy for the domestic abuse themes alone, but Slappy at last establishes himself as the A-lister villain he's known to be. While this is good scary content, it does lose some momentum when the climax is sprung on us. Yep, with no build-up at all, the climax just pops up here. The jerk sister interrupts the villain speech, and for no reason whatsoever, Slappy just reveals that he's alive and attacks them. Why did you do that? I thought the plan was to coerce Amy and make her look crazy. Yet now you're just attacking? Why? Slappy's not happy! We of course get more scary faces! <laughs> And the episode drifts into a Scooby-Doo chase scene. Scooby-Dooby-Doo, where are you? We got some work to do now. Scooby-Dooby-Doo, where are you? We need some help from you now. Come on, Scooby-Doo, I see you. Pretend if you got a sliver. You're not fooling me, cause I can see. You know how I've been praising Slappy's side of the story a moment ago? Well, I think I figured out why I've been feeling indifferent towards this episode. I think the stuff with the Kramer family is the weakest part of the writing. Zero effort has been dedicated to Amy, and her middle child angst is just dropped. It's gone. While the sisters get chased, Sarah, the jerk idiot bully who has spent 90% of this episode hating on Amy, is suddenly a good sister who loves Amy now. Yep, just like that, she's good now. You always win when you are good. The writing for these people is just astounding, isn't it? It's almost as if all the hatred for Amy was totally pointless. The stupid sisters get to safety, only to then recall that their idiot brother is still unsafe, and they risk their lives to go save him. Ugh, that's the problem with superheroes. They're too heroic. Can't you just let him die and say that you tried? We won't complain if you don't find him. What a shock, Slappy ambushes the dynamic Dunderheads, where they all have a stupid standoff. <laughs> okay, word of advice, writers, you've kind of soiled the creepy atmosphere when your psychomaniac plays cowboy. Or the cowboy crab! Slappy actually manages to overpower Amy despite being two feet tall. You wimp. But just when it seems over, we see who gets the final kill. Fatality. Slappy sucks. Stop saying that. <laughs> the family comes in, and everything seems to be perfectly A-OK -okay now. Look, even the idiot brother is still alive. I know, I know. I wish Slappy killed more people in this, too. Curse you, PG rating! <laughs> but wait a minute. If the stupid brother was upstairs the whole time, then who saved them from Slappy?
Wait a sec. Goofy? Is that Goofy? <laughs> this place is no picnic, but it sure beats working for Disney. Oh, yuck, oh, yuck, oh, yuck. Yep, this was our twist ending. Dennis was alive too. He's also a living dummy. The living dummy number two. And Goofy. And he killed Slappy so he could reclaim his family's love. Or maybe kill them all himself. I don't know. Now, you're all probably wondering, how the heck is Dennis alive? Well, the answer's simple. You see... <laughs> so, yeah. Dennis, Dennis wins. wins. And now his home will follow his regime rather than Slappy's. But your reign of terror is at an end. Now a new reign of terror begins. My reign of terror. <laughs> the end. And that was the weird conclusion to Slappy's Wacky Wonder World, Night of the Living Dummy 2. How does it hold up? Well, it does have some flaws, but overall, it was pretty dang good. Let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. The Kramer family sucks. The siblings are idiot bullies until they suddenly aren't. The parents are your usual brand of useless. And worst of all, Amy is a generic bland hero who ultimately pisses away her character arc and amounts to nada. I know the Goosebumps protagonists aren't always these deep titans of relatable drama, but I hate how the story sets up Amy and her middle child syndrome like it's going to have some sort of payoff, only to never follow up on it. In fact, Dennis gets more grand payoff than our actual hero does. How pathetic is that? Oh, yuck, oh, yuck, oh, yuck. If Amy was just your run-of-the-mill normal kid hero like most of Stein's protagonists are, I would honestly not hold this against the episode. But they do tease that they were going to do more with her, then plum forget about it. That's bad writing. The rest of the story is also nothing too special. Most of the narrative is Amy being blamed for Slappy's evil deeds, having no one believe her, and Slappy winking to the camera that he's alive and radical. Nothing too new, even for Stein's writing. However, what truly made this episode so memorable, creepy, and energetic was the villain. Slappy is easily the best part of this. Like Uncle Howie, the villain saves this episode. He's creepy, he's humorous, he's well executed as an effect, he's a true danger to the main characters, and he is pretty compelling compared to all the other characters in the plot, since there are some unnerving layers to his dark side. Slappy's debut in this plot is a simple evil plan, but it's all done to introduce us to an incredible villain who the Goosebumps fans view as the greatest monster of the franchise, which I believe he does succeed at. Slappy's side of the story is the better content, while the Kramer family is the dime a dozen cliché storm of horror tropes we've seen a million times before, on stuff like Really You, Child's Play, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Twilight Zone, and even on Stein's other episodes. My big gripe with the story is that Slappy deserved more stakes in it, while the cookie-cutter human drama on Amy's side falls very short compared to the puppet's higher schemes. I wanted more of Slappy doing more malicious stuff, like threatening to kill the parents, not his stupid pranks or Scooby-Doo shenanigans. What I'm trying to say is that it had a perfect villain, but a generic story featuring a generic helpless hero. Pretty typical stuff for us adult horror viewers, but decent stuff for the child audience. So, I grant the fan favorite dummy's debut a gold skull. I won't sugarcoat this, I came so close to giving this one a silver skull. Since the Kramer drama was just so boring and so eye-rollingly lame, However, Slappy is the huge saving grace, since he makes a typical horror plot so much fun and dark to sit through. 
It's not his most impressive episode, but it's a good payway towards what will come in his sequel tales. As this story stands alone, it's fine. Yeah, just fine. It's nothing too special, and honestly, I loved Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns and Click more than this one, but Slappy's first outing was decent. A few setbacks thanks to the stupid human characters, but the dummy sticks out. I would recommend this one as a warm-up episode for Goosebumps, since while it is good, it's a more simple taste sample of the sheer madness Goosebumps holds in store for us. I love Slappy like any Goosebumps fan does, but this one has a few too many meh moments. His sequel stories really ramp up his fear power, and get insanely creative with his horror style. Admittedly, the third living dummy, Bride of the Living Dummy, and even the Goosebumps movie were much grimmer than this one was. While Slappy started off on a fairly lukewarm entrance, he is one of those ideas that got a thousand times better as his nightmares went on. If you love this episode, that's fine, but just get ready for the encore. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, or just tune in for more videos posted here on Wolf Entertainment. I'm your host, Catastrophe, and always remember that whenever you find a new toy tied to a spell card, always have a trap card in place just to be safe. See you all next time! See you in your dreams! He's gonna hunt you down The shopping mall, you'll hear a werewolf growl A giant bug is smashing up the town The zombies grab your soul and fall down Call me every month, you're locked inside Follow me, we'll terrorize Follow Slappy When I'm done, the key will all wake up You're gonna come alive Follow Slappy Every hall we're hearing this cry Just from the mind of R.L. Stein So follow Slappy Gotta find you more But it sure beats working for Disney. Oh, yuck, oh, yuck, oh, yuck.